Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. Uh, I am your host, and today we are talking with uh, Fair Vote Canada's Board of Director, uh, well, a director on their board, Ryan Campbell. Ryan, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, and, and uh, likewise. Uh, so, Ryan, I, 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 let's get this out of the way first, out of the, out, off the bat. What is Fair Vote Canada? So Fair Vote Canada is, um, I believe, not the oldest, but the largest uh, electoral reform organization in Canada. We support, um, among other things, uh, particularly proportional representation. So adopting proportional representation for all levels of government, uh, be it municipal, provincial, federal, regional, wherever. Now, how did the idea of this organization come about? Because I've done my research, it started in 2001, but what happened in 2001 when uh, this organization needed to come together to form, to start advocating for changing the uh, way Canadians vote for their elected politicians, federally, provincially, and municipally? So I think what, what brought it forward was there was a series of what I would call weird or bad unrepresentative election results, both federally and uh, provincially. Uh, BC had an election in 96 where the party with the most votes didn't get the most seats. And in fact, the party that came second on votes had a majority government. Quebec saw the same thing happen. Um, uh, New Brunswick uh, had uh, an election where the Liberals won every single seat. Like there was no opposition whatsoever. Um, and, uh, and then we had this federal level, we had this extreme polarization along regional lines that uh, the Reform Party or Canadian Alliance didn't have much chance, really no party except the Liberals had uh, significant representation in Ontario. Uh, and then the West was dominated by reform. Uh, and that wasn't really reflective of how people voted. So a number of people and groups started coming to the same conclusion that it was time for electoral reform in Canada. Uh, Stephen Harper was one of these people. He wrote a piece uh, in, I think, Next City magazine uh, supporting it. Ed Broadbent was another. Uh, so it was Hugh Siegel. So it was a it was a broad coalition of people that decided the voting system wasn't working. Now, when did you get involved in the organization? Just for my listeners to and my viewers to know that uh, while it, it's been around since 2001, when did you get involved? I got involved in 2012. It was about the same time I was getting involved in, I just left university. I was getting involved in federal politics. And so I connected with some like-minded people. I'd been a supporter of proportional representation for a while and got recruited onto the board of directors uh, for Fair Vote at that time, uh, which I served for three years then. Um, and that was, I was involved in the push to get the Liberal Party on board with electoral reform, which in theory we were successful at, they managed to get into the platform, unfortunately did not actually get adopted once in government, um, but uh, we gave it a, a good good effort there at least. Um, we, we being fair vote, not the Liberals. But, uh, we will talk about that uh, that 2015 election uh, later on, but we uh, will stick to the organization for a bit here. Um, as a liberal, you're a liberal, you're self-identified liberal. Is this a liberal organization or is there members of different parties that make up this organization? Because some might say, hey, if you're a liberal, then all the board members are liberals and it's a liberal ideology that we want to change the voting system. But I'm assuming it's not, correct? Yeah, our, our membership definitely skews uh, a little bit to the left. Uh, so not really the Liberals, but more of the Democrats and Greens. But um, our roots were a pretty broad uh, multi-partisan coalition that include, includes and included Liberals and Conservatives. Uh, and, uh, and I see it's kind of when the Conservatives took power, they kind of became less interested in electoral reform. Uh, same thing to the Liberals, so it kind of waxes and wanes. We see some Conservatives coming back to us now. Um, Michelle Rempel Garner being the most recent example, she calling for uh, proportional representation. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a current skew in in the sense that the people that the electoral system isn't working for are more likely to support changing it. Um, but there are people like myself that you know, as Liberals, we do pretty well under first past the post, but. I don't think it's fair and I don't think it's right and I don't think it's benefiting the country and I'll always put country before party. 
Well, I am glad you say that because anyone who knows who's listened to the show before knows that I I, I ran for the Liberals in 2015 under the uh, changing the electoral uh, uh, ballot measures. So I, I know where Ryan's talking about here because I I, I was supportive of that measure uh, in the platform as well. So I just want to make sure that people are aware that I was a former Liberal candidate, may not be a Liberal now, but I was a former Liberal candidate at one time. Um, I want to talk about proportional representation. Can you explain proportional representation? Because we, we have so many different methods of voting that are potentially out there for discussion with first past the post, with mixed member proportional, with proportional representation, with rank balloting. So let's talk about what Fair Vote Canada wants to see happen, and that is proportional representation at the ballot box. So what does proportional representation mean, and how would that change how we elect MPs MPPs, MLAs, councillors, mayors. Right. So um, the the what proportional representation is is really the idea that how people voted should be reflected in the results. So if a third of people vote conservative, a third of the MPs should be conservative. But it, it could also apply to to things that aren't about party. Right. If a third of people want uh, stricter gun control or less gun control, that should be reflected in the results too. Uh, it, whatever the issue is, whatever the quality is, whatever people are voting on, it should be reflected in the results. Um, so it's not strictly about parties. There's a bit of a misconception on both sides about that, but parties are one important measure, I think, of how reflective uh, results are of, of voting intentions. In terms of how you actually do that, um, there is a variety of ways. So we endorse generally, uh, systems that are, are moderately proportional, uh, that they keep a geographic link between constituents and uh, and their elected officials. So you, you might have larger districts, but you still have districts. And they uh, keep the link, direct link between voting for an individual. So uh, you still tick a box next to someone's name, not just a box next to a party. Um, a very simple way to do this, you can imagine you have a riding right now elects one MP. You could have a riding that's four times larger that elects four MPs, um, or maybe not four times larger, but say it elects four MPs. Uh, Calgary would be a good example of where you could do this. Um, and so each party would put up four candidates. You pick the party you like best, or, or the candidate you like best from, and it could be an independent even. If the party gets a quarter of the votes, they get a quarter of the seats. And who that, uh, who fills that seat from that party would be whichever candidate got the most votes, personal votes from that party. Uh, it could be that simple. It could be more complex. You can keep the district sizes smaller. If you use a mixed member system, for example, you can combine it with a ranked ballot. Um, but really, it can be, it's just quarter of the votes, quarter of the seats. Make sure there's a, a, a connection that that is reliable there between how people voted and what they get. How would that be different from what we have now? Right now you go into the ballot box and I'm just playing devil's advocate with you because mm. uh, my listeners would be listening to this right now and saying, well, well, how is that different from what we do now? We go into the ballot box and we mark an X beside the person who votes for who we want to represent us in our constituents and the person with the most votes, that individual person, because you have to remember first past the post is very much a... Uh, uh, while it's the person with one more vote than the second place person wins, wouldn't that be the same as proportional representation in those districts where the person with the most votes over the second place would get in? Like, why wouldn't you be wanting proportional representation across the board and say, in Alberta, if the Conservatives get 32%, they would get 32% of the seats. The Liberals would get 15%, so on and so forth. I just, I just trying to clarify how voting districtly as well as proportionally is better than what we have now. So you, you could do what, what you said for something Alberta wide, um, where you just, you have a list of candidates for all of Alberta and you pick which candidate you want. And that might make sense under a mixed member system, for example, but uh, under the district example I gave, um, what would be different, your voting procedure would be the same. You, the guy or girl, or, or them that, uh, that, that uh, you like best, you pick them. And 
maybe they get elected, maybe they don't. But the difference would be that right now, only about half of people get someone they voted for actually elected. Whereas with a four seat district, it'd be more like 80% of voters would, would get someone that they voted for elected because um, maybe your top candidate wouldn't be there, but someone else from the party you voted for, for example, would be would be there. Um, so that, that would be the main differences. And if you look at, uh, for example, it, like I mentioned, Canada right now, about half of people get someone they voted for elected. New Zealand, it's about 95%. It's about 90% in uh, Germany, 95% in Sweden. This is like de democratic norms internationally are that people get representatives when they vote that, that are of their choosing. And that's not an international norm that we, we conform to. And I think that's really unfortunate. Another difference would be you have choice within your party. So you might like the conservatives, but not like your specific conservative candidate. Well, now you have multiple conservatives to choose from, um, which is, which is it, it can be nice, a little bit less of a compromise internally on who you, on, on your values then, right? And, and you, can, you can, if you want a more green-minded liberal, you can pick a more green-minded liberal. If you want a more populist conservative, you can pick a more populist conservative. Um, so I think that that's a nice feature as well, that kind of choice. Um, yeah, is the I, will I, and the demand there to change our voting system? In your time with Fair Vote Canada, have you seen public opinion start to sway towards changing the way we vote? Because let's I'm just looking at the 2019-2020 elections where the Liberals won the most seats, but the Conservatives got the most votes popular wise population uh, they they had more people vote for them because in alberta saskatchewan they had more people vote for them in previous years where liberals won more seats because the, the heavy populated centers like at uh, ontario and quebec voted for the liberals are you seeing more of a sway towards uh, you, you mentioned michelle rumble gardner the mp for calgary nose hill coming on board with changing the way that we vote are you seeing a upswell of support to change the first past the system, first past the post system that we have in Canada? I, I think so. It depends on which quarters you're in, like, um, but uh, I, I do think there is momentum behind us. Um, there, polls show broad support for the principles of proportional representation. Uh, when you get into the details, it's where it gets tougher. Um, there's a lot of misinformation. It's not something taught in schools. Uh, so about 40%, I think, ECOS had. Of, uh, of Canadians think we already have proportional representation. So that's that's a difficult level of misinformation to cut through, but that's that's why we exist, is, is to cut through that and to push for it. Um, I think when you see governments though, this government right now has the weakest mandate of any government in Canadian history. So when you see fewer and fewer Canadians included and reflected in their government, that starts to bring into question the legitimacy of the government. And I think there's a recognition that that is becoming an increasing problem, that people see government as illegitimate because it doesn't have the same popular support. Horror fans unite. The Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown is pleased to offer a free audible copy of David Mercer's newest book, Living Death, A Love Story. The book is about Nick, who having suffered the horrible loss of his wife, plays the hero and rescues Jenny from her abusive boyfriend. Deciding that he has one last adventure in him, he invites her on a cross-country road trip. Little did they know that the world, as they knew it, was ending. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca to enter into the draw. Simply tell us your favorite horror film by April 14th and be entered. We, you talk about misinformation and uh, there's a few myths about proportional representation that I want to get on the table and get your opinion on. Uh, a, a very... Uh, well-known uh, Alberta political commentator made a mention that if you, I, I'm assuming you know who it is, <laughs> it made mention of if you change the way that we vote to proportional representation, then you would have fringe parties, his words, not mine, like the People's Party of Canada being elected into office, and you would see more smaller parties that, in his words, don't have the right to be in the office, get into the House of Commons. 
What do you say to that when people tell you that if you change the voting, then you're going to get more diverse opinions in the House of Commons? Well, I, th I think it's true that you'll get more diverse opinions in the House of Commons. I would see that as a feature, not a bug. Um, I frankly don't believe it is the place of the voting system to exclude people just because I disagree with them. Um, and I definitely disagree with the People's Party. Uh, but 800,000 people voted for them, and I think they deserve representation of their choosing. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of greater fragmentation, it's not necessarily the case. It depends on what kind of proportional system you choose. We favor mixed systems or moderate systems. Like I said, my example was like a four-seat district. It's not Alberta-wide. Um, countries that use those kind of systems have pretty similar uh, party systems to what we have already. Germany, I think, has six parties in their parliament. We have five plus the People's Party on the on the verge there. Um, New Zealand has has five parties in their let in their um, parliament. And New Zealand's a really interesting case for that because they adopted proportional representation in 1996, and their party system hasn't changed that much. Um, a point that some political scientists make those Canada were already voting like we have proportional representation. That the level of fragmentation of our parliament is reflective of a moderate proportional system is what you would expect in Ireland or Finland or somewhere like that. So if we're gonna vote like we have PR, why don't we just adopt it and give people what they're asking for? Um, <laughs> so I, I think the fragmentation thing is a bit of a, a red herring. Um, and same with the extremist uh, or the, the like the fringe thing. You know, I, I think it's interesting that the same people and the same person in this case that you're talking about um, that says that first past the post or rank ballots in single member districts would protect us from views we don't like um, or extremists. Uh, also accuse existing conservative MPs of being extremist. So you can't have it both ways. You know, either, either first past the post is protecting us from extremists, therefore the conservatives are moderates, or the conservatives are not moderates, and first past the post has made them the official opposition. So it, <laughs> you kind of got to choose your ground there. I, I so I find that I find that actually a pretty hypocritical argument that people make. Um, and, and frankly, and it, not a very democratic one either. I think that it's not the People's Party or it's not the People's Party or their ideas that deserve representation. It's the voters that chose them. Eight, those 800,000 voters that I think all voters deserve or to, to a reasonable limit, vote, large numbers of voters should elect MPs. The, the one, uh, I shouldn't say negative that I, hear all the time about uh, the, the one thing I hear all the time about uh, proportional representation is you're always in the state of a constant election because no party is outright ever going to win 50% plus one of the votes cast in no, no matter what situation. The last time I think we did that was Diefenbaker and that was what 60s and 70s when the last time we had a party win over 50% of the vote, the actual population vote. That would put us in a state of perpetual minority governments. And the one, the one country that I look at when I see the minority situation that they go through is Israel. They have proportional representation and they're always in uh, election period. I think they've had five elections in the last five years, if I'm not mistaken. I, 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 I could be wrong there. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But what is your, what's the Fair Vote Canada's stance on saying, it, it's better for democracy when parties actually have to work together in a minority situation where you have to work across the aisle to get things passed instead of just ramming things through with 34% of the vote, but 54% of the seats in the House of Commons. Where does the part, where does Fair Folk Gannon just stand on talking about the myth that proportional representation is bad for election cycles? So there's been, I think Dennis Pilon, he uh, specifically did work on this and he found that uh, countries that use proportional representation are, have less frequent elections than ones that use first past the post, less frequent than we do specifically. But Israel's had about the same number of elections since their independence as we've had since they became independent as well. Um, 
but there's always outliers, right? That uh, we had two elections in two years um, and we could have another one any day, depending. Um, Let's hope the not. Idea that, I really hope not. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, 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 as someone who knocks, knocks a lot of doors, I, 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 it would be good for my waistline, but not good for my, my sanity. Um, there, there is um, some truth that, that a single party government would be less likely under pro rep. Though frankly, five of our last seven elections have been minority governments here. The difference is that we uh, would get um, we get multi-party coalitions, stable coalitions. That's what Germany has right now. They have the Social Democrats on the on the center left, the Greens on the left, and the Free Democrats on the center right. They formed a coalition. Their coalition governments last for quite a while, uh, usually the full term of of parliament. Um, same with Sweden, same with uh, Denmark, and these are the kind of places that we look to for um, for our kind of voting system, not particularly Israel. But Israel, keep in mind, Israel also has a lot of problems unrelated to the voting system. That uh, they're they're definitely an outlier, not just because they like pro rep is the most common system in the world. Eighty percent of countries have some element of proportionality in their in their or 80% of developed countries, I should say, have some element of proportionality in their voting system. And they don't have the, the same problems because Israel has societal divisions that go back decades, centuries, longer. And it's not a panacea, it doesn't solve everything overnight. I would say they've made good progress with it though, um, because they have for the first time ever an Arab-based party in their government. Um, so they are overcoming some of those divisions. You, you've talked about uh, geographically changing, like how we already have sort of proportional representation ge geographically, because we are seeing a large portion of Western Canada represented by one party, because a large portion of Western Canada supports one party over the other. Changing that, as someone who lives in Calgary, who's someone who knows that there are people in Calgary who support the Liberals, who support the NDP, who support the Greens, who support the Animal Protections Party. Would that do democracy better for having more parties represent each province instead of having a swath of one party represent a province, even though different opinions can be found in those provinces? I think that's a really good point. Um, and it's it's a point that was made uh, in 1979, there was the Pepin Robarts Committee, uh, Commission on National Unity. And they came back with exactly that kind of an issue is that, you know, Alberta all votes one way, or doesn't all vote one way, but gets representation all one way, right? The, I think in, in, in 1980, Alberta voted 20%, 22% for the Liberals, no seats. Um, and you get a situation like right now in Toronto, where Toronto voted 50% liberal, but 100% of the seats are liberal. Um, and these distortions, these exaggerations- Just, just, of, just to clarify, there is one independent. I will put that out there. He was a liberal when he true. was elected. <laughs> true, <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, um, but, uh, but I mean, he ran with a liberal label on, on the ballot. Um, and uh, so that those regional divisions are definitely real, but they're exaggerated a lot by our voting system. And I think it actually robs of us of, and our parties of talent. The reality is there's good conservatives in Toronto with good ideas that are smart and talented that could be in government or could be in parliament and that have, don't have a realistic chance of doing so because of where they live. Same applies to liberals in, in rural Alberta or in much of Calgary. Um, same, same applies to uh, to New Democrats and Greens in lots of parts of the country. It's robbing us of talent that the best people don't necessarily get um, get elected because they're not from the right neighborhood. Um, and you can see that in Scotland, uh, they, the party that's made the most progress in Scotland at growing their support since uh, in the last two or three elections is actually the Conservatives there. Uh, they have uh, Ruth or had Ruth Davidson is a leader. She was elected regionally on the proportional side of the system. They use a mixed system uh, because conservatives didn't have a real shot. Uh, she was the first uh, gay leader of a uh, conservative political party in the Commonwealth. She grew her party from third to second and, uh, and was very successful by all accounts. 
Um, and that's the kind of talent an urban conservative in Scotland would not get would not get a, a crack at, at, at representation otherwise. Uh, you can see that in New Zealand right now too. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, she was elected from the proportional, they used a mixed system, the proportional side of their system. Her first two elections were from that side. That's where uh, that talent came from. You can look at it also in your own uh, provincial history because Alberta used proportional representation in the cities, in Edmonton and Calgary for about 30 years. Ernest Manning was elected proportionally in his first election um, in Calgary. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, th these are the, the kind of talented and influential people that you want to, uh, to, to see in, in our parliament. You want the best people for the job there and in, to just write off half the country basically because they live in the wrong, they have the wrong postal code. I, I don't think is, is is a smart way to govern. The the running joke, and I should never say this, is, uh, because I, I was told this numerous times at the doorstep when I was running in rural Alberta for the the Liberals up in Peace River Westlock in 2015, was you're you, we like you. You're with the wrong party because the party that won, the Conservatives in uh, Peace River Westlock, could have ran a paper bag and could have gotten elected because yeah. they believe that it's just the party and we're just going to vote for the party and not for the person. Because, and that's where I was very much in favor of changing the method because I believe that we shouldn't just be voting on the party. We should be voting for the person who best represents you and the, your values. And changing that method does help. And I just don't like the fact that no one ever gets elected with less than 50%. There's a few and far between that actually do. Um, I want to talk about financing. Financing okay. is a big thing because the way that we do it now is you donate to your local constituents association. They that's their war chest for the upcoming federal election or provincial election or municipal election. How would that work? How would financing of proportional representation work uh, through an election system? Would it be through a bat? Like I, I, I can't. I, I haven't done my research on how New Zealand's finance laws work, but I'm assuming Canada's finance laws would have to change to reflect proportional representation. I don't think they would necessarily have to change, but we do definitely support changing our finance laws. So right now you donate to candidates or parties, you have the choice. Um, and you could keep that system in place under proportional representation, but you don't have to. And you don't have to keep that system in place right now either. So we definitely support a return to a per vote subsidy, BC uh, did that uh, recently. Now that's has some flaws as it, it's backwards looking. Um, so a party, a new party might emerge and it might be polling very well at like 15, 20% of the vote, but they have no money because they didn't get any votes last election. So you want something forward looking as well. That's why the donation aspect is still important. Uh, there's an interesting project in Seattle called uh, Democracy Vouchers, um, where you actually, rather than give money out of your own pocket, you you personally get to direct taxpayer dollars to go to the candidate of your choice. So you're not out of pocket, um, but it still requires active consent um, from voters to, to draw that money in. And I think that also helps address some kind of inequalities in that the people that can afford to donate get more influence than the people that can't afford to donate. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's the, the, one, the one big thing that I, I hear all the time about purse vote subsidies is I don't want my tax dollars to be paying for the Bloc Quebecois. While I disagree with what they stand for, separating Canada, and I would never vote for a party that does, I don't want my tax dollars going to a party that represents that. So can you can you flesh out the idea that you just talked about, about actually directing where your party, your money, your tax dollars go through those candidate selections? Because some people would say, well, I don't vote for the, I don't support the Liberals, so I would never want my tax dollars to go to the Liberal Party of Canada or the Bloc or the Greens or the Conservatives. So how do you do that in a a uh, per vote subsidy method? So, it, it, well, I would say for a per vote subsidy, your tax dollars aren't going to the block. Your, their tax dollars are going to whoever you voted for. Um, and for a, a, a democracy measure, it'd be going to whoever you directed it to actively. Um, so that would be my, my response uh, to that. I think it's, it's, um, it's something to consider and it's, it's something we, we are, are supportive uh like whether we keep first past the post or not 
we would like to see more public financing, but I think people need to understand too, that we already have tax dollars going to these political parties and their candidates through the tax credits uh, that are, are quite generous for up to a certain value when you, when you donate. And I, I would stand by those tax credits and, and those subsidies as well. I think this is, oh, I'm gonna take my fair vote hat off for a moment and just put on my Ryan, the political campaigner hat for a moment. Um, and just say that I think that there's this, we don't want to go like full American where there's like billions of dollars spent on elections. But at the same time, democracy is important. And I think the idea that you should be able to make a living based on your in, your work in democracy is not a bad idea. Right? I, I, there's a populist saying, oh, well, the elites, the elites, the elites. But at the same time, you want competent people too, right? You want competent politicians, you want competent campaigns taken to the people. So I don't think that, that a little bit more uh, would be bad, but that's not the Fairville Canada hat on there. That's, that's, that's Ryan just, Campbell's hat on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that, and that's just, yeah, I, I think like the amount of campaign manager gets paid, uh, if they get paid, um, is, is trivial. Um, you, you might get, if you're lucky and your party wins, you might get some work out of it down the road. Um, but, uh, that that's very dependent on, on the election results too. So there's no security. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. And I, I, I see a lot of talented people in politics go to the States and they go to the United Kingdom and they go to places that, uh, where they can make a living. I, I agree. We, we we seem to always lose our top political can uh, backroom organizers to different countries, and I wish that they would stay here. So if we can support them, because I think they do do service and they actually help our our democracy when there's people actually working behind the scenes as campaign managers, as campaign volunteers, and if we could pay them properly, I would be in favor of that. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Let's let's talk about the elephant in the room, though. This campaign's been going on since 2001. It is now 2022. 22, 21 years since the campaign launched to change our voting patterns. 2015 was our best shot. 2015, Justin Trudeau came out and said this would be the last vote, last election that was held under first past the post system. Now, the running joke in my family is. Everyone, everyone promises the world during an election, once they get elected under a certain system that elects them, they don't want to change it then. So how do we change the system when parties get elected to a comfortable majority or a minority under the system that we currently have? So it's definitely a problem. We call it the, the turkeys not voting for an early Thanksgiving problem. That's a little bit that... <laughs> derisive but uh, I, I think there's truth in that is is that there's a self-interest issue the conflict of interest is a problem i would point out first of all though that uh, the first time the liberals promised proportional representation or electoral reform it was specifically proportional representation and it was 1921 under Mackenzie king he promised it a second time in 1935 i think he was actually a genuine believer in it but he never was able to get his caucus on board um and pierre trudeau promised it in uh, 1980 as well uh, and uh, wasn't able to get his caucus on board either. Um, so there's there's been several good kicks at the can, and they've all, you know, they've come up empty, unfortunately. Um, the exception being Alberta and Manitoba switching. They promised proportional representation. Uh, it was the Liberals in Manitoba. It was United Farmers in Alberta, and they did it in the cities where they happened to not have run any candidates. <laughs> um, so that was a little bit cynical then too, but they did change the voting system and they did have an element of proportionality. Our, our view right now is uh, we think a citizen's assembly is a good way to uh, cut out or reduce the amount of political self-interest there is uh, changing things. Um, 
that's it was a, it was a model that uh, was employed in BC and Ontario. Uh, we'd say probably to more success in BC than Ontario, just based on the those were followed by referendums and the BC referendum it got 58% support. But I think most people on both sides would concede that that result was more support for the process than for the outcome of the process. Um, so because, that that's, be, I, I want to talk about that for a second because I I was on the ground in that 2011 2000. Seven uh, Ontario uh, referendum hmm. on the mixed member proportional because I was a journalist at the time there. And I remember uh, trying to explain how the system would work to people on, like to, uh, as I did a streeter. And it took me longer to explain to them what was going on and how this would happen, how this change would happen. And people were just turned off on the idea because. If, if you have to explain, as you always say in journalism, you have to explain you're losing the battle. So I, I, I want to say, yes, we need to change our system, but there needs to be the elevator pitch. You, you're a campaigner. You know the elevator pitch that you have to do at the doorstep to convince someone to vote for you. How do we do that? How do we convince the general public without confusing them on how to change the voting system and why it's so much better than what we have now? Well, I would say, first of all, don't put it to a referendum at all. Um, really? I, th I think just do it if it's, if, it's the, if it's the right thing. Now, that's from years of cynicism that our movement has got from this, because the trouble with the referendum is it are we've had, I don't know, maybe seven of them so far. Two of them actually got majority support. And in both cases, the government response wasn't to respect that majority support, but to just do another referendum until they get the result that they want, which is a no. Um, and you, you can see this on other issues. Um, there's a big status quo bias in any referendum. You can see that with Meech Lake. Um, you can see that with uh, the HSD in British Columbia. You can see it with going back to uh, prohibition in Canada. And, and the, the, there's you know, very few referendums have passed. We've actually got advice uh, from people who professionally campaign on ballot initiatives in the US, where they're more common that unless you have 70% support going out the gate, don't even bother campaigning, you're gonna lose, um, just because of the status quo bias. Um, so that, so I don't think they're a very good tool that way, unfortunately. Uh, they're a great tool for blocking reform. Uh, <laughs> um, so that would be, that would be my, my, uh, my suggestion there is don't do a referendum, but at the same time, you need to have public support. You need to have the public on board. Uh, I think you need to do it with multi-party, support it shouldn't be one party just ramming through a reform for selfish interests uh, or selfish reasons uh, we're seeing uh one party running on it doing essentially that in ontario right now unfortunately um uh, the ontario liberals um, oh that's right and i want to talk about ranked balloting here because del uh, stephen del duca the ontario liberal which is coming up here the ontario election in uh, june 3rd or second or sixth, one or the other. I don't know the exact. June, date. I don't know the date. I know it's June. June. Insert random date here. Um, he has announced that this is going to be if the Liberals win again. The Justin Trudeau mantra: if this, if the Ontario Liberals win, they would be uh, in favor of changing the first past the post system to a ranked ballot system. Now, uh, I have uh, scoured the internet on the probability of the Liberals winning this next election. It could happen. We did see the Liberals go from third place to a, a majority government federally in 2015. So anything could happen. But let's be honest, as Justin Trudeau did, he'll say it, he'll want his way, doesn't happen. So we'll just keep first past the post. Do you think a ranked ballot system is worse for democracy than the first past the post system? I would say it depends on the ranked ballot system. And so one thing that, that it, I find frustrating personally, and I frankly think it's a little bit dishonest by the proponents in the Ontario Liberals and elsewhere, um, is that they just say, well, we want a ranked ballot, but they don't say which ranked ballot. They just, so they're creating misinformation as they go. Um, what they're talking about is ranked ballots, single winner ranked ballots. So you have one district, you rank your candidates, and there's a runoff until either people that all but two get eliminated or until someone gets 50% support. 
Um, they would say it's until you get 50% support quite frequently, like Alberta, Manitoba, BC, we use this. Um, and only about half of people bother to rank anyone second at all. And so only maybe 5% of voters are even getting a second vote counted ever. Um, so is it, is it worse for democracy? I think in our context, it can be. Um, I think that uh, in, in terms of uh, the Ontario Liberals, it, it, it's a little bit frustrating. I, I'm just gonna, this will tie into it, but I, just to express a frustration with politicians in general here, is I think there's a tend to be, tendency to be very short-sighted. So the, the like Pierre, Pierre Trudeau, he supported some element of proportional representation in 1980 and his caucus rejected. And that caucus got absolutely decimated in the next election to the point where they would have actually benefited if they had gone along with it. Um, so the, you, you always think if you won once, you'll win again and you'll win again, and it doesn't happen. And no one plans for when the next disaster strikes their party. That's what this is, it's insurance. Uh, if you're looking at it from a self-interest standpoint. For the Liberals, this is what I would call rank ballots and single member ridings, I call a win more. So when you're already winning, you win more. You get a larger majority, uh, that kind of thing. So there, there's an appeal there. There's this, you know, we want as many seats as we can get. That's why I actually believe Bill Duca, when he says he'll change the voting system, but it, it's it's not necessarily the right change because a larger liberal majority, you know, opposition is important too. Um, and and that's something that, uh, that I don't think is being considered there is, is you don't want to wipe out parties that, that, that are going to form the next government, right? The, the, it, you're not going to be in government forever. Uh, and having that continuity is important. I don't want to overstate this though. When, when we used it in, again, BC, Alberta, Manitoba, only about 2% of the, the um, actual results were different than what the first pass, the post results would have been. Uh, in Australia, again, different kind of ranked ballot because they force you to rank every single candidate. Um, but it's Which about their 5%. ballots are like five pages long, if I'm not mistaken, because I've seen one of their ballots before and it's so well, that's their convoluted and so confusing that you look at it and you go, what is going on here? Like, can I just put an X beside the person I want? And, and that, that's kind of like the weird thing, like about the Australian mentality that you have to rank everyone that encourages a proliferation of candidates in, its, in itself, right? So they've actually done reforms to rein that in. Uh, so it's, it's actually not, not that bad anymore. Um, but uh, when you rank everyone, you're forced to rank everyone, only about 5% of the results change. So I don't want to overstate to say this is like this horrific change that will destroy democracy. It'll make things worse, somewhat worse, but not massively worse. Um, that, that, that's the, the truth there. Um, it's, it's a change in the wrong direction, but not a massive change. I, we, we upset the proponents of these reforms when we say it's a phony reform, it's first past the post with extra steps. Uh, <laughs> but I think there's truth to that, that, that it, it, it's, it has all the flaws of our current system just exaggerated a little bit more, not a lot more. Um, what bothers me more about the Ontario case is honestly not, and, and, and it, it's infected the federal levels a bit too, is, is not even the reform itself, but it's the self-serving motives. That if we win a majority, we're gonna bring this in, so we get an even bigger majority next time. I just think that that is such a cynical and, and, and self-serving way to go about politics that I, I find it very, very distasteful. Now, we've talked about the proportional representation, how it's been used by 80% of democ democratically elected governments across this, uh, the, the world. Is there any countries that currently use that ranked ballot system where you go in and you vote for just X, Y, Z, one, two, three of how you want to vote? Or is it ranked ballot slash proportional representation like they do in Australia? Because I can't think of one country that actually has a ranked ballot system. Can you? Uh, Papua New Guinea. That's the only one. <laughs> of course you would know that strange tidbit of information. Of course. Yeah. Papua and, and Yeah, so that's what uh, I, I made a joke, though. Like Australia does use it for its house, though. It's the Senate that does it proportionally. And the House is, is strictly that way. So 
I made a joke that, you know, Australia has lots of snakes. Stephen Del Duca wants us to be like Australia, say no to snakes, say no to Stephen Del Duca. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> every single one of my former Ontario liberal friends have just called me after this airs and said, why did you have him on? <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I was an Ontario liberal member too. I, I, I went to school at U of T. I joined the Young Liberals. Uh, I, I, I'm American. sorry, I, I I stopped listening to after you said UFT. As a Queens boy, I will never. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> but so yes, Queens I I worked in I worked at Queens Park as well, so I yeah. know the Ontario Liberals quite well. Uh, I think there's a lot of good. Like I'm a liberal for a reason. I think there's a lot of good, even in Stephen Alduca in Ontario Liberals in in any Liberal Party. Um, but I think on this file, there's not much good. Uh, unfortunately so do you have hope to wrap this up because we're almost at the hour mark here do you have hope that we will change our system 21 years into this the fair vote can organization is still going it's still picking up stream like we said at the beginning michelle wemple gardner a conservative has said we might need to change our voting system to a proportional representation to ensure that what has happened in the last two elections don't happen again do you have hope that we could actually do this where first past the post will be sort of the dinosaur of voting methods in Canada soon? I, I do. I do have hope. I, I, I think there's there's rays of, of sunshine that uh, in PEI, they're going to do a citizens assembly uh, there, which is what we're, we've been asking for. Um, they uh, and it, it's under a conservative government, but it's with a conservative premier that actually endorsed proportional representation. Uh, which King. is, yeah, uh, which good for good for him. And um, most of the MLAs there actually represent seats that voted yes. So there's a self interest uh, in a sense as well, uh, even though the overall vote wasn't successful. Um, frankly, though, like whether whether whatever the chances are, I'm going to fight for it no matter what. I I, I don't think I. I think there's a good chance of it being adopted. I think it's going to happen uh, maybe when we don't expect it. Uh, there's a great um, poll I remember hearing about in, in, a, in a Berlin politics course where the people in Berlin thought the Berlin Wall would never fall even a month before it did, that they would never see it in their lifetime. Sometimes change happens suddenly and from unexpected quarters. And I'm going to keep on... Uh, fighting for it either way um i hope i hope i get to see it though i do too um i want to ask you one last question then we'll actually do a wrap-up but how can people learn more there's probably someone driving on the deerfoot right now in calgary yelling at their car radio listening to this or someone yelling at their youtube screen right now watching this at work saying why didn't you ask this question how can people learn more about the organization and get involved if they believe passionately about changing our voting system to proportional representation uh so fairvote.ca uh, that would be the place that, that's our landing page. I and mean, we've got resources on there. Uh, one I would especially um, encourage people to look at is fairvote.ca slash evidence. We haven't talked about it much here. We've been focused more on like fairness, the side of it, but there's a lot of evidence that proportional representation also leads to better government, uh, stronger economic growth, greener environment, those kinds of things. And, and this is independent research. It's not research we commissioned. It's at, um, so that's something I would encourage people to look at as well. But if you want to get involved, fairvote.ca. Well, uh, just because we're uh, up against a timeline here, uh, Ryan, I will have you back on to talk about the evidence. I will have you back on to have that conversation about why proportional representation does give that, uh, why, why the evidence shows that proportional representation does lead to those things that you just talked about. So please look forward to that email in your inbox to okay. welcome you back onto the show. Um, but Ryan, uh, actually, before I do that, uh, for anyone who's listened to the show before or has watched the show before, scroll down. Links to Fair Vote Canada are in the show notes, the website, the uh, Twitter, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Facebook page as well. Click on it, follow them. They do great work. Uh, Ryan, it's been an honor and pleasure of having you on the show. And like I said, look forward to have that second conversation later on this year. Thanks. Um, so with that, everyone, have yourself an excellent rest of your day. This is the Cross Board Interviews with Chris Brown. Keep talking, everyone.